I V M. Hey everybody, welcome to another week on the IVM Podcast Network. As I mentioned last week, we're going through this COVID-19 outbreak and because of that recording schedules, we're trying to keep them, but it's a little uneven at this point in time. Thank your intelligence. While you are stuck at home, I think one thing that might be interesting to do is maybe check out some of the complete series that we've done. The Kulava Cartel, the Woody Woodpecker, Cricketwala Chronicles. These are limited series that are complete. Might be a good time to check out with those. Also want to thank our sponsors this week, HDFC Life and Paytm Money. And with that, let me get you onto your show and uh, stay safe, everyone. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. I'm Manoj Keval Ramani and today I have with me a special guest. Andrew Small, all the way from the US in Washington, D.C. Andrew is a senior transatlantic fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States and a non-resident senior policy fellow uh, at the European Council of Foreign Relations. He is, his current research focuses on U.S.-China relations, EU-China relations, and broader developments in the Chinese uh, foreign policy and economic policy domain. Um, for most listeners in India, you probably are familiar with Andrew's work on the China-Pakistan relationship. I highly recommend his book, uh, The China-Pakistan Axis. But today we're not going to be talking about Pakistan. We're going to be talking about China's role uh, and China, the perceptions of China in the US and Europe, particularly given this uh, coronavirus pandemic and the impact that it's having in terms of the geopolitics of what's happening and how this is shaping up. So, Andrew, welcome to the show first. Thanks very much. Delighted to join you, Manoj. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, Andrew, so let me begin with sort of looking at the U.S. right now. Okay, so today we have about 65, 68,000 cases in U.S. Uh, you're sitting in D.C. Uh, what's the scenario like right now over there, given that all the talk is that the U.S. is now going to be the epicenter for this pandemic? Uh, well, so, I mean, the situation in the U.S., I mean, as as with a number of the the locations where testing hasn't taken off on, on a large enough scale, um, it, there are still elements um, that, that, that are hard to predict in terms of um, how this is going to ripple out across the country. Um, there's very differentiated responses in different states. There are different epicenters, um, New York in particular. Um, and I mean, as as we see, there's 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 very differentiated uh, responses in terms of the kind of levels of lockdowns and things that we're, we're we're seeing in different parts of the country, and the kind of the views that we're we're, we're seeing on 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 how long the, the the degree of the shutdown that we've uh, that we've already seen in the U.S. should should last for, which is um, in a sense, uh, I, I think, for a lot of people, adding to the anxiety about how this is all going to be uh, dealt with over time. There isn't at the moment. The, the sort of national consensus that you're seeing in a lot of places about what the appropriate response to all of this uh, looks like. Um, and I think there is uh, certainly a, a, a strong sense that there's been a real lag in, in, in the response. I think there's still a lot of concern about how this is, this, this is being dealt with. So I, I, I think at the moment you're seeing the kind of the real spikes in, in, in certain specific locations, particularly New York right now. The rest of the country, I, I think we're still before the, 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 the real kind of peak of the storm. Which is fascinating, right? Because the fact that the U.S. hasn't been able to build that national consensus and the fact that, you know, in the early days of the outbreak in China, I mean, I remember because in January, Trump was in India and there was a conversation about, you know, how this is being handled in the U.S. And I remember there was this comment by Trump saying, there's one case, it's from China, you're all going to be fine. To then going there, well, this is a hoax to then going to something completely different. Uh, and today to the point where there was over the last couple of weeks, this entire wrangling over naming uh, the virus, you know, the COVID-19 name uh, and Trump calling it the Chinese virus and Pompeo, you know, pushing the idea of, you know, blaming China and the Chinese pushing back on all this. A lot of this has to do with domestic management in America in terms of how they've managed the outbreak in America, but also in terms of there's this geopolitical wrangling that's going on. Um, is there this sense of uh, outrage with regard to China within sort of, is this sort of widespread in the US or is it, uh, you know, a specific political class? Is it bipartisan? Is it what's the public mood? Well, I mean, I, I think on this, you have two different things going on. One is clearly a shared sense um, in within the US, whether the public kind of on a bipartisan basis, that not just China um, as such, but the specific way that the Chinese Communist Party 
uh, handled the initial outbreak of the, the virus in Wuhan. It's had a significant effect on uh, the degree to which the virus has, has spread, that if a different system had been in place on, on, on the Chinese side, then it may have been possible to lock this down um, at a much, much earlier stage. Uh, so I think there is a kind of shared sense of culpability there on the Chinese part. At the same time, you also have a high degree of blame deflection taking place on this as well, because I think there are plenty of people who think, regardless of how this um, uh, started, the response from from the US side should have been uh, much, much, much more effective. um, And the the kind of denials that we saw from Trump were also kind of systemically conducive to a, a less an adequate response on, on the U.S. side. And so I, I think in terms of the, the language um, around Chinese virus, Wuhan virus, things, things like that, um, I'm not sure there'd be a bipartisan consensus on, on, on taking that sort of approach. I, I think there's also concerns about the, uh, the implications for, for instance, racist attacks on Asian Americans, which we've seen taking off as a result of this. Um, so I, I think that strand of it, the blame, I, I think, is, is, is well understood to be on, on the Chinese side. But I, I think for a lot of people, the concern right now is not the attribution of, of initial blame. It's, it's what's happening right now, um, how, what sort of response the US can be putting in place that's effective, and some degree of analysis of, of how we got to this stage uh, here, given that we've had several months of lead time to be able to prepare better for this. From a broader point of view, I mean, the fact that, uh, so like you've clearly identified that there are a couple of different strands to this. And one of these is this sort of xenophobic strand of thought. One of these is uh, a sense that, you know, a shared sense of culpability that the Communist Party's failures uh, in December, January in acting to contain uh, the, out- the outbreak and actually actively suppressing the information. Um, and then subsequently now in terms of, you know, how do we actually manage what we have on our hands right now? But there's a sort of a common thread, right? You know, each of these sort of plays on the other. So, and that's what you're seeing today when there's a conversation going on at the, you know, there are stories about this conversation at the UN Security Council having a discussion on this, uh, or there was a conversation between the G7 foreign ministers, if I'm correct, and there was the argument that, well, we can't, or the leaders, we couldn't come up with a common statement because of the US insistence that this should be called the Wuhan virus. So each of these trends sort of plays onto the other and it stops cooperation. And, and that particular G7 story also tells you a little bit about somewhat of a split within uh, the US and its European allies, right? Yes. I mean, if we had a number of potential alternatives, I mean, there are alternative Republican presidents, there are alternative Democratic presidents who would be dealing with this differently. I I think some of this does come down to this specific administration. But yes, I mean, I I think the view on the on the European side, which, um, as I'm sure we'll get into in the discussions, has also been pushing back uh, quite hard. Um, on, on China recently about how it's been uh, dealing with, with the crisis and, and all the propaganda that we've been seeing from the Chinese side too. Um, but pointless forms of um, confrontation right now are, I think, understood to be uh, poorly judged in terms of what the priorities are around the, the, the response. We, we don't, we, people know that this, this originated in, in, in Wuhan. They, they know this started in China. Most people know exactly, as you said, the degree of culpability that, that the party bears for its initial culpability up and suppression of the information. We know this, and we now need to focus cooperatively um, on dealing with a set of issues. And if the US administration puts active obstacles in place to, to doing that, I, th- I think that's just seen as uh, needless and unhelpful. And the Chinese response, I think, is also understood in, lo- in lots of respects to be unhelpful because we're, we're being, uh, the, I mean, China has not responded to this with a sort of mea culpa. Um, we, we failed in the initial stages, but now let's kind of quietly get on with cleaning up a lot of this this mess and doing what we can. Instead, we're subjected to all of these kind of propaganda operations to suggest that actually the party and the the Chinese system worked spectacularly well and China is to be praised for its response to the to to the virus um, and and, and all of these sorts of things which which came up in the discussions in in the last 24 hours and also created an obstacle. So I I, I think think on both sides, um, there is the, the sense right now that 
the kind of politics and the propaganda uh, around this are starting to take on a, a very unhelpful role when it comes to the actual practicalities of, of, of dealing with the response. And I, I think on the European side, um, but I think in lots of other places as well, I, I think the interest would really be putting a number of these issues aside for now and, and, and focusing instead on um, more effective collective responses. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. I mean, I recently did a piece on the kind of information that's the kind of sort of narrative that's coming out from China, uh, and it's quite diverse. It's uh, at one level, it's about sort of deflection uh, at another level, which was sort of characterized by this idea that, oh, was it the U.S. military which planted this virus and something like that? You know, so there's conspiracy theories, too. There is an argument with uh, which uh, Chong Lan Chang put forward, which was essentially that, well, it might have first been detected in Wuhan, but that does not imply origin. Um, and then there was much more down the line about, well, OK, we can leave all this aside, but look at how much aid and how much support we are providing and you know we are sort of doing this bilateral initiative with different countries we're also participating in a multilateral effort i mean uh, xi jinping spoke to uh, uh, emmanuel macron this week and he was talking to him about a, if i and if i get this correct he was talking to him about a shared community of health for mankind which rings as politi- as political as anything in the world from coming out from a Chinese news agency. So uh, there's a lot of this that they're trying to push, you know, where, uh, you know, where these leaders which are now providing international public health goods. And uh, there's a lot of friction because of that within the EU. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of this sort of pushback. I mean, I, I can see this in India where there's a lot of anger on social media with regard to China. And the anger goes from, well, you created this problem and now you're acting as though you're you're dissolving it for the world and you're this grand savior. How is this playing out in Europe? What is the sort of response in Europe, given that there are also dynamics within the EU, which would be a lot of friction within the EU, given that countries would need support. And if every country is is going into a lockdown and is taking care of itself right now, how would this play out within the European Union? So I I think within Europe generally, I think in the first phase of this, it appeared China, to a certain extent, was swinging in to be helpful. They were providing medical equipment and and, and so on. Um, There there have been kind of shortages in Europe. There has been a need to to, to get this equipment in. Um, China, of course, had surged its own production capacity. It already was a major source of production um, capacity in in the world for a lot of this uh, equipment. And China, of course, also bought up lots of masks from around the world, including in Europe, and Europe also sent substantial supplies of aid and, 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 and medical support to China at the peak of the crisis as well, very discreetly, didn't make a big propaganda push around this. This was a, an, an immediate and urgent need. Europe and certain specific countries uh, kind of swung in to provide it. Uh, what, what we saw nonetheless in, in the first phase was, OK, now China is to a certain extent, reciprocating. They're, they're, they're swinging in to do uh, what they need to do. And yes, we may blame China for how this was handled, but the, the, the need is as the virus kind of uh, ripples out beyond China and as, as China's China itself reaches a stage in, in which it's able to start emerging from the crisis, it can now play a relatively constructive role in, in dealing with others. Um, and so I, I think there was a sense in Europe um, from a number of countries that was, okay, put geopolitics aside, let's, uh, let's focus on crisis response. But then exactly the what you just described in terms of the the different measures that that China has been taking, certainly some active disinformation around the source of the virus, which I I think is not the main concern actually on on, on the European side. I think the main concern has been this combination of a propaganda push essentially to show that China is uniquely swinging into help where Europe in particular, within Europe, uh, other European countries, the EU itself, are implicitly failing. And the fact that China's worked hand in hand with a number of politicians uh, inside the European Union and outside, in the, in the case of, of Serbia, um, essentially to push this this narrative. I mean, they've worked three of the most sort of obvious cases in, in, in the last uh, week or so have been Viktor Orban, who, of course, um, in, in Hungary um, has a sort of substantial pre-existing hostile agenda to the EU. Luigi Di Maio, um, the five-star uh, leader and Italian foreign minister, who also has a certain amount of animus directed at the EU. And Vucic the, in, in Serbia, um, who also came out and made this public, big public statement about China's there in our hour of need and and, and, and the European Union isn't and, and all of this sort of thing. So I think the sense is 
is that what China's been doing has worked in concert with um, and been instrumentalized by, but to a certain extent that China's kind of encouraged this narrative that Europe is failing, other member states are failing, and China is the only one who can who can help. So what you've started to, to, to get as a result is, I think, much, much, much more pushback from a number of the major member states. We've seen it from France, we've seen it from Germany, we've seen it within the debate in Italy itself, pushing back against these efforts. And then most recently on, on, on Monday, um, after the meeting of European foreign ministers, uh, you have this very striking piece that came out from the EU high representative for foreign policy, um, effectively the, the kind of EU's foreign policy chief, Borrell, pushing back against this kind of uh, aggressive Chinese messaging, talking about the battle of narratives, um, and that Europe needed to sort of stand up uh, more strongly against uh, these sorts of efforts. And it wasn't just directed at China, um, but I think there was a sense that um, although the, the overwhelming priority is to focus on this as a public health crisis, and secondarily um, as an economic crisis, there are going to be a lot of political actors, and, and China is doing this to a very, very pronounced degree, um, who are going to, throughout this crisis, look to instrumentalize the whole thing for a series of other per- propaganda purposes, in, and in some cases, in ways that are extremely damaging uh, to Europe itself, to the European Union. Um, and so that's why I think you've started to see this this kind of pushback. And I mean, it's, of course, the public opinion in Europe on, on this was already uh, pretty skeptical, given, again, people's understanding of where this emanated from. You know, people were watching um, how, how all of this started. So this is all playing out in a backdrop, not I mean, if, if if the virus had started somewhere else and China was now swinging in to be a global public health leader, I think it would still have wound people up a little bit, This some of this positioning. But I think there is seen to be a certain uh, chutzpah about um, the way the thing played out and then coming in to say that China is actually the only one that can is the responsible actor and, and invalidates the system and, and, and China is the, the leader in, the, in this area. I think that rankles somewhat more given the, the, the way the whole thing has evolved. All right, that's that's fascinating. I want to pick up this thread of the idea of the battle of narratives because that's something that uh, got some play in India also this week because we had uh, a piece by the former Indian Foreign Secretary Vijay Gokhale in which he was essentially arguing about how India manages this crisis would be important because from the point of view of the you know there being a systemic uh, sort of competition. I mean, I'm not quoting him, but that's the idea of the piece that you know there's a systemic competition. This is about India being a the world's largest democracy, how does that handle this as opposed to the Chinese system? And, you know, in that sense, this would be important from a future shaping of the world order point of view. So that's, uh, I want to pick up the thread from the point of view of the of Europe and US, given that there is this battle of narratives happening, but at the same time, there is friction between sort of in the transatlantic partners, among the transatlantic partners. See, how do you see Europe's position evolving? Because already Europe had been talking about this idea of strategic autonomy for the last couple of years at least. And given the current scenario, would you see a Europe, a European Union first looking to sort of ensure unity and then looking to sort of uh, buttress itself as a pole sort of, if not necessarily decoupling, but creating its own sort of independent space uh, whether it's in terms of what is important from a manufacturing perspective, from, from, from a national security perspective, from a technology perspective, from a security perspective. Would, would you see those sorts of changes happening, which are happening in the U.S. Uh, when it comes to foreign investment, which, are, which have existed in China? Would you see something like that, where Europe, Europe would be looking at itself as an independent entity and trying to buttress that much more and reduce its reliance on the U.S. and China? So, yeah, yes. Um, and let me just kind of, just as a prelude to this on, on the kind of battle of narratives question, and, and, and then I'll, I'll answer that in, in more detail. I think the interesting thing about this is that it's not just a question of kind of how do the democracies and, and, and how does kind of an autocracy like China uh, respond to this? Um, I think one of the big questions around this has been kind of what sort of democracy succeeds. And, and I mean, there are a number of different uh, ways of, of analyzing what, what has been an effective response. Of course, there's a huge um, amount of the kind of uh, battle of narratives as well playing out around uh, questions of social insurance, healthcare systems, questions around that. I mean, essentially, um, do sort of semi-social democratic systems um, in in this kind of context uh, in Europe perform uh, better and more effectively than the the, the US system? So I I think that really is there and, of of course, has an important element going into the US presidential elections around precisely these questions around around healthcare provision. Um, But you've also, you 
also have the questions around if you compare the democracies in in Asia that have have performed extremely effectively at, at dealing with this, notably uh, Korea and, and and Taiwan, and of course Taiwan providing a a striking counterpoint across the strait um, from the Chinese system. Um, I think the question is what what is the form of democratic model as as well that seems to be doing better than others, and I, I think this is why there's there's a lot of interest now in in these questions around kind of uses of technology and how that's been be, been approached in, in a case such as Taiwan versus uh, so some of the other Western democratic systems. So I think it's going to be a more complex picture that uh, emerges from this in terms of kind of which version of the system is seen to be uh, successful in this. I, I still don't necessarily think it's, it's going to be something that then validates a kind of unitary answer and, and certainly not one that validates how, how the Chinese system has responded. But I, I think there is going to be, uh, in particular, when it comes to things like um, tracing individuals and, um, and, and, and some of the sort of measures that have been have, have been put in some of the societies that have dealt with this effectively, um, uh, some important future questions around um, how we uh, relate to technology in certain democracies where, where some are in a more advanced place than, than others. Um, but on the on the European question specifically about these kind of decoupling issues, yes, I mean, I think the, the, the premise of your question, it is almost certainly the case, um, and we've already seen statements from, uh, for instance, the uh, German economy uh, minister uh, Altmaier from the French uh, economy minister Le Maire, um, based basically talking about a substantial revisiting of certain levels of dependency that we have on China, um, in particular when it comes to probably a wider array of kind of essential uh, goods and and, and services. I, I think it has created a sense of a kind of Worrying degree of um, dependence, um, and and again, I mean, it's it's not just the China question. I, I think the question in in this context is going to be how much more needs to be possible on a kind of national or European basis in a series of kind of foreseeable crises. And I mean, a global pandemic is a highly foreseeable crisis. I, I think there is going to be an approach after this to to, to look at a series of of other imaginable crises um, and work on the assumption that we exist in a geopolitical environment where there is not a high level of trust. It's going to be very difficult to rely, in some cases, even on very well-established um, partners for Europe, such as the United States on this. And so there's going to have to be a need to do more alone, if necessary, in a number of these sorts of imaginable uh, circumstances. So I think it probably uh, will lead to something of a of a push in certain discrete sectors for a, a, a certain degree of greater decoupling. And, and I mean, there's a narrow definition of that, which is just a kind of crisis response kind of preparedness version. And there's, there's a more expansive version, which is a kind of mirror or more of what's been going on 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 the US side in terms of these broad uh, questions around whether it's wise to be as reliant and intertwined as the US economy is on the Chinese economy and, and, and China writ large, given all the questions that exist around the Chinese system, uh, its, its willingness to instrumentalize some of these dependencies for political and security purposes. So I certainly think it will be a big push in that direction. Um, and again, we're, we're seeing this already even in areas such as, for instance, uh, investment screening. There's been a big push in the last couple of days from various actors on the European side, uh, to, including from the European Commission President von der Leyen uh, to talk about uh, protecting European companies from uh, takeovers um, and asset acquisitions during a time of economic vulnerability and a number of mechanisms being put in place for for, for that. And uh, some of this is directed at China, but some of this is also directed at um, at the US. Um, uh, the, the 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 case in particular, there was a, a a a German company where the sort of murky stories around Trump attempting to put in bids for this uh, company that may have a vaccine. And the concern was that, that Trump was going to do this to, to have kind of proprietary rights to do this on a US only basis rather than on a global basis. So I mean, there is a certain amount of suspicion directed at the United States, as well around some of these questions right now in, in Europe, but a very, very heavy component of this is is, is, is really directed at, um, at, at China. And, and I mean, in terms of supply chains and, and, and some of these sorts of things, that's, you know, that, that's a bigger element of certain forms of dependency than the kind of economic relationship that that Europe has with 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 the United States, that kind of in you know in the sort of higher end sectors. Yeah, so this is going to. I mean, at the end of the day, it sounds like. I mean, depends on how far uh, you know how far countries go going forward. Um, this is going to put a put massive pressure on the sort of global trading system uh, and the interconnectedness, which then could sort of eventually down the road have a ripple effect on 
you know, security concerns because, uh, you know, the lower your dependency is, the greater risks of security might also arise in a more traditional sense because you might end up, you know, the costs of conflict tend to go lower as your dependencies also reduce, or at least that could be the case. My final question to you is this, and this is a bit of crystal ball gazing, but uh, from the point of view of, uh, you know, the US and China, we've seen a couple of very acrimonious years. And January 15th was that uh, phase one trade deal, which sort of signaled some sort of a, you know, pause, if not some sort of an agreement per se. Uh, and then we've now had this two and a half, two odd months of this, uh, which has taken things to a new low. And so in January, it was sort of things were getting better, you know, at least temporarily. And now we're again in this phase where this is as bad as it's been for the longest time that I can imagine. Where do you see this going forward? I mean, do you see uh, both sides working together or do you see momentary sort of periods where they would work together and then sort of deepen friction or do you see this sort of progressively a downward trend that you're going to see? I think a lot of it's going to depend on the elections in November um, because I think although there is a strong bipartisan consensus around the overall direction of US-China policy, certainly a sense among Democrats as well that um, you know, competition with China, great power competition generally needs to be a greater priority in US grand strategy as a whole. This, this is something that everyone accepts um, is going to be a much more endemic part of the global system and how the US has to handle itself in, in, in the years to come. I, I think there's, there's, there's certainly bipartisan consensus around that. China as the top priority, yes. But I think on, on the Democratic side, there are some important differences that, that are there and, and, and would have an effect on, on what these dynamics look like. Uh, I think there is more of a sense that uh, a cooperative space should continue to exist between the US and China on a discrete set of issues, including um, climate change and and probably, um, if defined in the right way, some of these questions around global health issues. Um, I think these 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 should fall into that sort of category, even if they uh, don't at present. So I think there will be a slightly more expansive cooperative space that, uh, that I mean, B- Biden, as it, as it appears, would look to define. Um, I think that we will also get probably a little bit less of the this kind of perhaps unhelpful forms of confrontation. Um, I think one of Biden's advisors described this as confrontation without competition. I mean, there's been an approach on this to take a kind of loud voice, push China, confront on all sorts of different spaces, but not necessarily put the underlying tools and measures in place to be able to compete with China effectively. So I think tonally, it would probably look uh, quite different. But I think in terms of the underlying substance, yes, there was the the kind of pause on the trade war front, but not a huge unraveling of tariffs um, on, on, on the US side. And really, it was a very, very narrowly defined kind of pause in the kind of confrontation between the two sides. I think on virtually every other front beyond tariff, all the other measures that the US has been putting in place have continued to move out and, and be expanded, um, including in the economic realm, particularly focused on issues around technology restrictions and targeting a whole series of Chinese actors in, in, in that sphere. So I think on most fronts, there is the expectation that forms of this competition will um, continue to roll out. If there's a second um, uh, term Trump administration, I, I think we can pretty much expect more of the same and a kind of second stab at, um, at, at trying to get progress from China on all the kind of structural economic issues that have effectively been parked as we uh, for, you know, for the, for the next few months as we have the run up to the to the elections. But um, uh, I, I think the tonal elements could look very different depending on how this emerges. I think the balance could look somewhat different. I think we could also see if, if a Democratic president wins much more of a focus on how do you marshal other partners and allies in building a kind of common front on China um, and a lot more energy going into that than we've seen from the from, from the Trump administration. But I think a lot of the underlying structure of what's going to be going on between the US and China is going to look pretty similar uh, now. And I think that's very strongly the expectation on the Chinese side as well. Fascinating. I said that was the last question, but I have one more, uh, which is, uh, and that this is, uh, so if that was crystal ball gazing, this is black, black box gazing. Xi Jinping, uh, stronger with this crisis or weaker domestically? What's your sense? 
That's super black box. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, but I, I mean, I think there's clearly been a significant volume of, of, of criticism that has, has not abated. I, I think there are always going to be these points in which all the pent up frustrations and anger about how the Chinese system has evolved under Xi Jinping were going to have certain kind of catalytic moments in which it was going to be very difficult to, to contain it. I, I think this is understood quite widely in China to be partly a byproduct of the specific ways in which the system has evolved in the last few years. Yes, we had an inadequate response uh, to uh, SARS, for instance, in in the past. But the, the the opportunity that so many other countries around the region have taken to learn from that experience and translate that into a much more effective response, uh, as we've seen from so many of China's Asian neighbors, in China's case, we not only haven't seen that, we, we've seen precisely the sorts of measures that, that people were concerned about, information suppression, locking people up, um, who kind of step out of line suddenly translate into something that creates a very, very um, pronounced crisis in the country. And I think it is understood to be something that's followed from the model that Xi Jinping has, has tried to put in place. So I struggle in one sense to see how uh, o- over time, this is understood to be an uh, ultimately a strengthening thing for, for, for Xi Jinping. There's always been this question of whether his consolidation of power um, is, it, I mean, technically it, it strengthens him, but it's also it has a certain kind of brittle quality to it, given the manner in which it's been approached. Um, and I think this is a, a reminder of that again. I mean, the amount that you've seen spilling out in the open in terms of criticisms and, and things among the Chinese public writ large has been very, very striking in, 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 in this case. And uh, I don't think those kind of feelings, um, not necessarily among Chinese Communist Party elites, although I think there's a lot of concerns there about how this, um, uh, about how the system has evolved in the last few years. But with the Chinese public writ large, um, I, I don't think it's going to be forgotten. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I agree. I don't think it's going to be forgotten. And I mean, uh, it's just a matter of time, at least with this is, you know, it's just about how the party manages that discontent uh, online and eventually if it spills over on the streets also. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for, the, for your time. Thank you so much for speaking to us and thank you so much for giving us all those insights. Uh, you're in DC. Please stay safe. Stay indoors. And we hope to have you again on the show sometime. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you too. All the same advice. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Take care. All right. Thank you. Bye. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website takshashila.org.in. Hi, I'm Sariyu Natarajan. And I'm Alok Prasanna Kumar. And we are the hosts of the Ganatantra podcast. On this podcast, we speak to academics, social scientists, journalists and activists to find out what's actually going on in Indian politics. On this podcast, we stay away from personality politics, intrigue and gossip and instead focus on the data, research and analysis that drives all this. So tune in to the Ganatantra podcast where new episodes are out every Wednesday on the IVM podcast app, website or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Welcome to Peak Planet, a new podcast where we delve into the fallouts of the growth path that we and indeed much of the world has chosen. Sustainable growth is the buzzword. Until we nail that down, we need to ensure that we keep our population healthy and also have the resources for our increasingly urban lifestyles. I'm Karthik Ganesan, a researcher at the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, a Delhi-based policy research institute where for almost a decade we've been trying to explain and change the use, reuse and misuse of our resources. In the first season of Peak Planet, we take up air pollution, public enemy number one and an invisible one at that. Increasingly, the most important risk factor for adverse health outcomes, air pollution has become the most unwanted byproduct for aggressively growing economy. Over four episodes, we find out how prepared our systems are to deal with this crisis. You can catch the entire first season of Peak Planet out now on the IVM Podcasts app or website or wherever you get your podcast from.